Jill, and I am an old house nut. I love historic buildings and homes. About 20 years ago, my husband and I started buying, living in, restoring, and then hopefully selling old houses. And ever since then, that is when I became very knowledgeable about what is restoration. Restoration is defined as taking uh, something and putting it back into its former, original, or normal condition. Taking something and putting it in its former, original, or normal condition to restore. It is through my love of historic homes and restoration that I also became familiar with the writings of Jane Jacobs. I call her the godmother of urban renewal. Jane Jacobs is known most uh, well for her 1961 book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. In this book, she writes about how the best buildings are those that can adapt to new uses over time, those that can change and morph. Well, today I'm going to introduce another concept to you, the concept of restoration. It's a lot different than 1961 when Jane wrote her book. So let me tell you, what is restoration? Restoration is a phrase I first heard from a guy named Nick Nisley when I took a class at St. Thomas. And he said, restoration is the process by which we make sense of our life stories. Restoration is when we tell, retell, deconstruct, construct, and envision our life stories. The act of restoration allows us to honor who we have been, who we are today, and who we want to become. I'm taking you now on a journey of restoration. So first of all, a personal vignette. I live in a community near here. And in 1996, I used, to, I used to work in a community 30 miles from my house. And as I would get up in the morning, get in my car, I would look around and I would say, gosh, it'd be nice to live here. That's because I felt so disconnected. My life was so connected elsewhere. And because I'm an old house nut and naturally inquisitive, I had been doing a little snooping around our community because I heard about a woman who had died and left her property, and it included an incredibly large, old, old house. And so I snuck on the property with my husband and our old house club, and this was the most dilapidated house I had ever seen. And in fact, it was worse than the house that we lived in, <laughs> which had been condemned before we bought it. So, Naturally, I just fell in love. <laughs> I saw this house with this hanging, swinging staircase with a one foot drop from one corner diagonally to the other, and I felt called. I said, I need to do something to help this house and this 50 acres of land on the St. Croix River. But I didn't know what to do, so I got in my car and drove to work back and forth. And then one day, November 1st, 1996, I did something quite unusual. It was a Friday. I took the day off. I didn't go to work. Instead, I met with a friend of mine who had started her own nonprofit. And I said, you know, this house is languishing. This incredibly generous woman died. She left this house, these 50 acres of land. She wanted it used for public good. There's no money. She made a little mistake or a little glitch there. <laughs> and what can I do? So when I was meeting with my friend, something very unusual happened. My phone rang. I answered the phone, and it was my boss. She said, Jill, you've been laid off along with 300 other people. I took it as a sign. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start of my restoring my life. What followed after that was that I delved into volunteering and then running and being an executive director of a nonprofit. Today, I can tell you that that house is 6,000 square feet. It's on the National Register. It's restored. 50 acres of land on the St. Croix River are now in a permanent conservation easement. It was a heck of a lot of work, and if I'd known how much at the start, I would not have done it. <laughs> but I did. 
And now I'm fully immersed in my community, fully immersed. And my community is larger because I'm involved with this community here. Second story. I take you now to a beautiful town. Let's look at some woods. This is a coastal community in Northern California. This is a town where they invented the phrase, happily ever after. So idyllic it was, and the people who lived there knew it and loved it. One day in this community, some youth went out camping. They put up their tent, cooked a meal, had a campfire, and the next day when they were done, took down the tent, packed up their garbage, buried the fire, and off they went. But something unexpected happened. The wind whipped up, a fire of unimaginable, cat catastrophic character took place. 12,000 acres of wilderness burned and nearly 50 homes were destroyed. The only way the fire was stopped was that the helicopters went into the bay, grabbed water, doused the homes, and the town stubbornly struggled to survive this disaster. While all of that was going on, meanwhile, the four youth and their parents turned themselves in and told their story. So what do you think happened next? Well, a firefighter wrote a letter to the paper. And in that letter to the paper, he outlined some things. He said, these youth thought they put the fire out. It was an accident. Then later, they had a parade. And all the firefighters came, and it culminated in a, in a picnic at the park. And the president of the firefighters club gave a speech. And he said, in ancient times, when people did something bad for a community, they were sent outside the walls of the community. They were abandoned and shunned. He said, I've learned about these youth and their families. And I've learned that they are thinking of leaving our community. And then he looked around and he said, we must not let that happen. And people there remembered things that they had done as teenagers. They remembered the mistakes that they had made, things they hoped no one knew about. And there was great applause. So what this community did with houses like these is they did something remarkable. They had a remarkable generosity of spirit and they forgave the youth. They told them they must not leave the community, that they were wanted. That they had, even though they had committed this egregious error, that they destroyed everything. That they were valued members of their community. They restoried that community. Think what it would have happened if those four youth and their families had left. What would those lives have been like, knowing that they'd burned down half a town, all the woods, and then been shunned forever? I don't know what is happening with those youth today, but I do know, I wonder if they don't still live there. Because if you had experienced that level of forgiveness, why would you ever go anywhere else? Last story. I take you now to a community that is 15 minutes east of Stillwater, Minnesota. This is it. New Richmond, Wisconsin. Anybody been there? This is exactly what it looks like. Population 8,455. Eight years ago, New Richmond was having some troubles, maybe unexpected troubles. Everybody knows city councils have problems, school boards, citizens argue, but New Richmond had a lot going on. People were getting, writing horribly antagonistic letters to the editor. They were arguing with each other. Neighbors wouldn't speak to each other. Tremendous divide and civil discord. What happened was a couple of community leaders heard about an individual 
who was over in Amory, just a few miles east of there, who was visiting. This individual was named Patrick Overton, and he was the author of a book called Restoring the Front Porch. It was essays on the art of community building. So they called up Patrick, and they said, Patrick, we'd like to talk to you. And Patrick said, well, I've got a little time before my plane leaves, so I'll swing by there on my way to the airport. That was eight years ago, and what has happened since then is that Patrick has worked with the new Richmond Area Community Foundation, and he's created something called the Leadership Trust Initiative. It is a nine-month course in how to become an engaged member of the society. It's a civil, civil, it's about civil discourse and democracy. And the nine-month course involves one day a month, and they each month 20 citizens come together, they learn about communication, they do their strengths through the Strength Finder, they study Joseph Campbell and the Hero's Journey, they do a creative, collaborative community project in subgroups. I know about it because I have been a spy there this year. <laughs> I'm not from New Richmond, but my, I was there with three other people from other community foundations, and we were watching to learn the New Richmond way. Who knew? New Richmond, Wisconsin. Well, today New Richmond has trained 114 people in this. And they said, well, that's good, but they want more. So what do they want? They're doing future walk. They are doing something where they're creating their community's path to tomorrow. And how are they doing that? They have set a bold and audacious goal to interview 1,500 people. So not just immediately in New Richmond, but the surrounding communities. They're reaching out to senior centers, nursing homes, schools, farmers, business people, everywhere. Imagine if our community wanted to interview 1,500 people to learn what we could do in the future. This is a story of something unexpected happening, the civil discourse. The, the serendipity of having Patrick there and then leaders stepping forward to take a bold action. Now, as I think about myself, and I'm in a community east of here that's known for its rich, lumbering history. And I think about that and I think, well, what are we known for besides our rich, lumbering history? And what could we be known for? So we could be known for people coming together and for our rich generosity. So I'm part of a group on the Stillwater Area Foundation and we're looking at teaching youth about philanthropy, about how to have seed money for great ideas and how to take the new Richmond model and Stillwaterize it. <laughs> and I don't know what will happen in the future. But I would ask you today, as you think about what's next, for your community. We can't go back to restoring things to their former, original, and normal state. We've been hearing all day about how things are different. Jane Jacobs says, the best things are those that can be adapted over time. So what can we do to adapt and change? What can we do with all of the help of Everyone around us, the people who are here today, who are coming tomorrow. One of the things I like about the New Richmond Project is that it is about the art of community building. And I always, I have a friend who's a poet, and she said whenever anything really important, art shows up. This is a sculpture by my friend Kate Christopher, and it, to me, emphasizes someone leaning forward and looking and wondering what comes next. You've got people who all look alike, but there's somebody who's leaning out there, who's wondering. What I'd like to leave you with today as we've looked at what are the issues in our community, I'd like to ask you, what's your story going to be? How are you going to recreate, tell, retell, reconstruct, deconstruct, envision your life? What can you do in your community? What do you want to be known for? All it takes is an act of incredible generosity, perhaps, generosity of spirit, generosity of philanthropy, 
It takes leadership to step forward, and it takes people to say, what next? Thank you.